Hi, welcome to the Betsy Jack Russo Studio and Gallery. I'm Betsy and I'm going to take you through a tutorial on botanical in watercolor. And the, we're going to be using anemones today. They're one of my favorites. Actually, Rhinebeck is home to the anemone because Rhinebeck was one of the first greenhouse growers and we still have one left. This goes back to the Victorian era when violets went out of fashion. We had a lot of violet growers, greenhouse growers, in Rhinebeck. So when violets went out of fashion, they shifted to anemones. They're a challenging flower to paint because they move uh, by light. Light influences them, has them open. They close in the evening. Hopefully they won't close up on us while I'm painting. And they have beautiful centers and they're just a very expressive flower. So I like to, there are many different ways to paint any subject matter. I'm just gonna show you one approach. And I'm going to, I've done a little bit of drawing, drawing to get started to save time. And I'll do a little bit more for you. But a lot of times I find that some of my favorite paintings are the ones that I do not belabor over the drawing. And sometimes if you paint a little faster, or if you draw a little faster, you will end up capturing the essence of the flower more than if you get too tedious and take too much time. So it's not a matter of rendering each of these exactly as they are, so much as capturing a feeling. I think capturing a feeling is a lot more exciting and it also allows you as the artist to be a little more creative. We're also going to draw on some, some of our resources that we've learned in previous tutorials, such as the five planes of light. That's how we can make things look three-dimensional on a flat piece of paper by using some of the techniques the old masters used and using light. So you see I've got my subject matter lit from one side, so I have a little bit of cast shadow from the centers, and there's more light hitting leaves that are facing the light, and I'm going to try to pay more attention to the essence of these flowers and how they are and how they grow, rather than trying to duplicate them. So as a painter, your job really is to uh, create your interpretation of the subject matter, not just to copy it. If we wanted to copy it, we could take a beautiful photo, and many do. But what makes painters, every painting unique is each artist's interpretation. And that allows you really more freedom to be really creative. So that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop drawing. You can always add things in I also like to exaggerate these leaves, so they're pretty intricate. I could be here for a long time um, painting all the details of every frill on some of these leaves. Uh, it does make my job easier that I've painted them before because I kind of understand the organic nature of their forms a little bit. So once you paint them a couple times, you'll start to study them and be able to interpret as you're painting as well. So they have this seed, this um, collar of leaves. They're one of the few flowers that continues to grow after you pick it. And it grows from the leaf collar, that lacy leaf collar. There is a stem that will grow up from there. And these greens really will help to set your flowers off. So I have a couple white flowers in here, you notice. And for a lot of people, they might be scary. But it's really beautiful to paint white flowers in watercolor. Instead of starting to find detail in the flower, you want to work with negative space in the background to have the white flower show up as the white of the page or some of the green leaves and foliage that will contrast in value as well. So uh, I'm not going to do the vase. 
That would be another separate tutorial. But one way, if you want to do something a little more organic without the vase in it, you can get your, your stems in and have them disappear a little bit gradually at the bottom by having one edge be longer than the other. Now, the centers of the flowers are made up of kind of a gumdrop shape, and then they have this little ring of a seed collar around it. And we want to make, suggest that to be a little bit three-dimensional without painting every seed. And of course, if you like to do a lot of detail, there's nothing wrong with that either. But I'm going to focus today on the basics, uh, which will be very helpful if you do decide to go on and get into more detail. You're also going to want to find, uh, think about your five planes of light and find a highlight on these. Even if you don't see one, you can invent it. It'll have those centers look more round and real. We're going to find a shadow side. And I'm going to start painting. So most of this painting I may do with my watercolor round brush. I may do some of the background with a nice big flat brush. You can also use a bigger watercolor round for the background as well. So I am going to think about the background color, but I think I will start with searching around for some good greens so I can contrast. I like to have two water buckets sometimes because I can mix my blues and greens and earth tones here and my more delicate colors of yellows and reds, um, my warmer colors here. If I mix them both, it gets muddy very quickly. So that allows my water to last a little longer without having to change it. So let's see, if I take a little Aurelian yellow with cobalt blue, I get kind of a sap green or an earthen green. I think that I'm going to use some cerulean. So I'm going to use a couple blues. Cerulean is going a little more on the green side. And if I mix that with a little bit of aurelian or the cooler yellow, then I'll get a more vibrant green. And I'm going to start with that. And I'm going to go ahead and chisel out some of these flowers by the negative space of the greens. And you can always change your drawing. You're certainly not locked in to keeping all the lines exactly as you have them. You can add things as you go. I can also use some of these pigments separately. It's always more interesting if you don't mix everything on the palette. So, you know, shifting your value by allowing one thing to blend into another I can take some warmer yellow, uh, this new gamboge, and maybe add some of that in. And when I'm painting these, sometimes I'm not looking at the subject matter, because I want to be free to be expressive and think about what's happening in the painting. I can also take a little bit of a darker green, like ultramarine, and go even darker in that crevice of the flower. However, I don't like to go too dark at the beginning because I'm not sure yet where I want my darkest darks. So it's better to stick with your lighter and medium values unless it's something you're really sure of. So let me think about, actually let me get some color on the stems. I'm going to mix a little cerulean and aurelian and start to suggest, I like to make the stems a little bit brighter to make them just stand out a little bit more from the foliage or the leaves. And I also sometimes will put some shadow while it's still wet or a darker green on that side. Otherwise I can do it when it's dry and then 
rinse and dry my brush, brush and blend the edge. I can also mix in a tiny bit of pink or red where you see that brown influence because if you mix a little red or pink in, it's going to become a bit brownish. All right, so I've established some colors for the greens. And let's remember to vary the values. Sometimes you can start by putting a little darker pigment in there and then directly bring in some of your yellow. And be expressive with the shapes of the leaves. Sometimes if you exaggerate them, have them spill down a little farther than they might drip, it will add motion to your painting and give it more feeling. Okay. A little bit more on the leaves, and then I'm going to do a little bit on the background. Using the tip of your brush to get some of these lacy edges. Always good to vary the value. Let's fill in a bit of yellow. Sometimes I'll wait and come back to put another layer that, of leaf that's behind one. Otherwise, it'll bleed together. So sometimes some, uh, some bleeding wet on wet edges are good. And if you want something to stay a little more separate, wait till it's dry and come back and put those layers in. Okay, so let's think about the background. I'm going to take a little cerulean. And a little, maybe I'll use a little cobalt violet. Mauve and greens are always nice together. Now, if that's too violet for you, I can always take a little bit of my green and gray it down. But you decide what you like. Now, I'm not committed to doing the whole background at once. Sometimes artists get a little panicked when you start the background because it's like you feel like you have to keep going because you need to have nice edges. But one way to give yourself a little break and not feel like you have to be committed to painting by numbers and filling it all in is to take your paper towel and just keep the edges soft. So you can always put a little where you want to, where you're a little more sure of yourself. And as you begin to complete the painting, you'll have a better idea of how light or dark you want to go where. But that brings out my white flower, and that'll help to keep me from making that white flower, putting too much information in and losing all the whites. Also, sometimes it's nice to have your background bleed into some things. Like here, I feel like I want to just let that mauve bleed right into that green leaf. So it's nice to have some lost and found edges. And you can leave some of your hard edge brush stroke if it's not too distracting. Okay, let's think about the centers of the flowers. It's always nice to move around the painting and not finish one whole flower, then do the leaves, then do the background because everything works in connection with what it's next to. So we're gonna gradually develop the painting by working a little bit everywhere a little at a time. It also allows some areas to dry, and then you can come back and work next to them. So uh, I would like to show you how to take on the center. The centers of flowers are really important. It's almost like the eye in a portrait. So really important. A lot of times if you haven't put the centers in yet and you're feeling like your painting's not happening, a lot of that is because you need those 
centers to, to give it the punch. So let's see. Actually, what I often like to do, actually, I'm going to use a little Payne's gray here. And I'm going to go dark first on this center. I'll do, a couple, I'll do a couple centers in a couple different ways. So I want the side facing the light to be lighter. And I'm going to leave a highlight, and I'm going to exaggerate it. Because I know the highlight would be on the left. Sometimes the leaves are blocking, but you do want to give the center of the flower some form, even if it's blocked by light. You want to invent it so it feels real and three-dimensional. Then I'm going to take a little bit of a lighter blue, like cerulean, or maybe even cobalt turquoise light, because it's lighter, and drop it in for the reflected light. It always makes it feel luminous and really adds attention to that center. Sometimes once you put a little of something in, you see it's working, gives you a little more confidence to go ahead and bump it up a little. Um, so let's start to get a little bit of shading on the white flower. I'm going to take a little bit of the cobalt turquoise light and just define some little shadows, some soft shadows that show up behind the petals. So instead of using gray, you could use a gray. And everybody sees color a little differently, and everybody likes different colors. So you could choose. You're just not going to put red behind there, unless it's Fovis painting. There's certainly nothing wrong with it, but we're going to learn how to paint a little more realistically first. Um, but you can use your color triad to mix a little bit of your red and a little bit of your blue and a little bit of your pink. To come up with these neutral mauves, and you can layer them. So I like to move around and put some shadows in with the blue. And then when it's dry, I'll work on another flower and come back when it's dry, and maybe layer a little bit of another color or two over it. And from a distance, when you are using multiple colors for your shadows, it comes off more like gray. And variety is always beautiful. So, and I can continue to use some of these greens to set off my white flowers. Oh, that may have been a white petal from the other flower. OK. I'm also going to put um, a little bit of a seed collar in. The seed collar, you want to start with a lighter color first, because you always want to try and get a couple of values on everything, at least a couple values. If you want your darks to be powerful, you need some lights and medium values. And up behind it, I'm going to let it dry a little bit. But up behind it, I'll be able to go and get a darker value, because on the inside of that top ring is where no light would get. The light would be hitting the outside. On the bottom edge, I would put the dark. It would shift to being darker on the bottom edge. And then I can go back to doing a little more shading. And on the next flower, I could use the lighter wash of blue and then come in and put the shadow side in. And I might lift out a little reflected light when that's a little drier. And I'll begin to 
suggest the seed color. Okay, so let's, let's put a little bit of paint on something that has some color. So let's take our pink. And what's beautiful about this flower, it's actually quite gorgeous, is the variation in it. It's got some soft pinks, lighter pinks on the inside. And then on the outside, it's a little denser. So I can put some darker pigment down and then soften the edge. Rinse and dry my brush so I'm not pulling all the dark back in where I want to keep it lighter. So that you always have a value that's going to move from light to dark. So let's do a little more over here. Now what's beautiful about this one is that instead of it being a darker pink there, It's got some green. So I'm going to kiss it with a little green and let that bleed in. And I can always go back and hit an edge with a little more intense pink. And let's see. So I'm just going to keep moving around like this, little by little. Your painting will come together. Now for the more inexperienced painter, I would suggest just taking one or even two anemones. Uh, a single anemone sometimes is very elegant and gorgeous and almost like a portrait. Or a pair is also beautiful. And the more you get to understand your subject matter, the more freedom you will have in being creative and not having to look at your subject matter for every detail. You can think about your composition, you can think about the feeling you're giving it, and what you want to say. So um, you can also, if I take a little alizarin crimson, or magenta, or a darker red, I can just have this other flower peeking behind the white. By showing a few petals back there and not the whole flower. Maybe I'll blend it with some green. And then gradually, finding where you might want to go a little darker, gradually building on your shadows. So once you have a shadow behind a petal, when it's dry, you can come back in and put a smaller shadow inside that, and it will give it more depth. And you can also put some subtle shading on the ends to suggest some of those little ridges, the shadows in between the ridges. And that will also give your flower a little definition as well. So you're going to gradually build these shadows. And you might find areas where you see a little more green in that petal, areas where it's a little more gray, areas where it's a little more blue, and gradually build your shadows.
so. Eventually you can put a little bit of color in between. Let's just try and pull this one together a little more. I'm going to go a little darker here on the side of that stem and where it goes down underneath there. And I also want to go and get a little negative space in between these flowers. So where you, you can add some darks to give it a little more depth. But you want to see some of the negative space peeking through. And that will help to unify. And you can also Take your big brush and have some fun with that to cover a little more ground in your background. I'm going to vignette this corner. And then I'll go back and bump up my centers, add my suggested camber to pop them out. I can leave some crisp edges or you can do a little bit of blending, but I don't want to lose my reflected light either. On this one, I think I'll lift a little. All right, we probably need to get a few more darks in here. So a little Payne's gray and a little Aurelian can make a nice dark green. And the greens also help to connect these flowers and unify the painting. So you're thinking about values, you're thinking about warms and cools. And little by little, your painting will begin to come together. So, let's get a little dark up behind that petal. So you can cre create depth in your painting if you find some areas to put some shadows underneath. and save some lights. Got to make sure you have a stem for every flower. Otherwise, it will look like something's missing. When you want to leave your stems kind of unfinished, what you can do is just push up from the bottom after you put the paint down. 
and have it disappear gradually. Put a shadow side in there. And think about your negative spaces. I may need more dark in here. Because that's going to pop the stem out. Okay, so there's still a bit more to do here, but I think we're going to stop. That gives you an idea how to take it on. And, oh, we did forget one important thing, and that's your cast shadows. And then I'm going to show you a more completed flower. Uh, now, you can take a little cerulean and put a cast shadow from, that's cast from that center. But you would complete this first. But when you're finished, then you'd put, everything's dry, you would put this delicate shadow that will be cast from your center. Bump up some of my shadows. Okay, so thanks for joining me. Uh, it's a lot of information, so dig in, save the whites of the page. Practice makes perfect, but there's always the unexpected with watercolor, and that's what makes it exciting. Okay, enjoy your botanical exploration in watercolor. Here are a couple of examples to finish with that are more completed paintings. So you can take on a painting with just white flowers, and we've got to set it off with a slightly darker background. And here I've used branches to give it just a little more a dark in there to set things off a little more. Uh, or this one, which has a darker background, using Payne's Gray in the background. So there's many different ways to paint in botanicals. Uh, thank you for joining us, and happy painting. From Betsy here at the Betsy Jack Russo Studio and Gallery, 43 East Market Street in the heart of Rhinebeck, New York. <laughs>